Hello, everyone. Welcome to Urban U. I am Abby Ishola, reporting outside of the CUNY Graduate Center, kind of. And I'm Ari Goldberg, coming to you from our CUNY TV studio, Master Control. And by Master Control, I, I mean my couch. We're both at home, like right. everybody. <laughs> More fun to at least, at least put a background, pretend we're somewhere. But Abby, good to see you. Good to see you too, Ari. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Tell us about Urban U this month. We have a great show planned. CUNY has been doing so much to provide resources for its students through the COVID-19 pandemic by providing laptops and food and money for those in need. We also want to ground the show in some real world experiences that we're all dealing with during this pandemic. So we're also going to have some interviews with some real students and some real faculty members to see how they're handling all this. And we have stories that we take before the pandemic started, so stay tuned. With medical resources stretched thin in dealing with the pandemic, CUNY colleges, like Queens College here, are among the institutions stepping up to help. Donna Hanover covers the story on CUNY's efforts to donate, and in some cases even manufacture themselves, urgently needed PPE, or personal protection equipment, for frontline healthcare workers. We were hearing stories in the news about lots of healthcare workers all over the place, obviously China, Italy, Iran, but also in the US, particularly in New York, who are facing pretty desperate shortages or would soon be facing desperate shortages of PPE. Realizing we had all of this stuff just lying around, a couple of faculty and staff from a couple of the departments said, let's really quickly do this, let's get it out to them, and made a couple of phone calls and everyone on campus who could help and whose help we needed jumped right in. And uh, we got the stuff wrapped up and ready to go in a matter of hours. With CUNY moving to online learning and closing its buildings to fight the spread of the virus, there was some urgency to collect items usually used in science labs. They did keep what was needed for vital Queens College workers like security, buildings and grounds, and animal care employees, but they donated a lot. Some surgical masks, some N95 masks, ethanol, various concentration, isopropanol, all kinds of things. We used to sterilize uh, items, lab coats, both disposable and multi-use, and boxes and boxes and boxes of gloves. We had maybe 30, 40 cases of nitrog gloves that we could contribute. Several other CUNY colleges did the same thing, including York's School of Arts and Sciences, Kingsborough Community College, and LaGuardia Community College. How do you and your colleagues feel about being able to contribute something that is so desperately needed by our doctors and nurses and EMTs. The people that are taking care of us are these frontline healthcare workers. And we wanna do everything we can to keep them strong, keep them going and keep them taking care of us and taking care of themselves. In addition to CUNY donating supplies for medical personnel, some CUNY professors have even created urgently needed items. For example, at City College of New York, there were 3D printers that were loaned to Hack Manhattan so they could create face shields for nurses and doctors with a whole 3D printer farm. Physics professor at CCNY, Ron Coder, explains what happened. I knew about a lot of 3D printers that were at City College, and so I sent the word out, I, you know, hey, can we fire up these printers and start making face shields for people? But City College was closed and nobody could get in to use that. And luckily I got permission from our president, uh, Vince Boudreau, to um, just go take all the printers out of City College. And we took them to Hack Manhattan and we set up a printer farm. Hack Manhattan and a makerspace called NYC Resistor began making headpieces starting with polymer which basically looks like wire on a spool. So the polymer gets fed into a print head that's heated. And the print head is on a motor that can move left, right, forward, back, and up and down. And really the print head, as it moves, it extrudes melted polymer. A few seconds after the print head goes by, the polymer rehardens. Now it's in a new shape. The clear part of the face shield is being made by another makerspace in New York City. It's Fat Cat Fab Labs that's in the West Village. They have a large scale laser cutter and they bought 5,000 pounds of this clear plastic transparency material and they're cutting them to fit the face shield of the headpiece part that we're building. The headpiece is reusable, uh, but the transparency actually is disposable. So what we're doing is when we give people these packages, they have one headpiece and 10 to 20 of the transparent parts so that they can throw away the transparent part and put a new one on if it gets dirty, because you can't really sterilize it without it getting cloudy. 
Several other CUNY colleges put their 3D printers and polymer to work making face shields as well. And Professor Coder says makerspaces at Columbia University and NYU are also involved. And there is a website, nycmakespppe.com. Some of these groups have worked together previously after Hurricane Sandy. When electricity went out, they built battery-powered repeaters so first responders could communicate by walkie-talkie while searching high-rise buildings for people in need of help. He says in this crisis, City College of New York really stepped up with 3D printers from the Advanced Science Research Center, the Spitzer School of Architecture, and the Masters in Translational Medicine program. And then all over campus, there was uh, 3D printing polymers, and we went around and scooped it all up. Because I am sure that you and your friends and colleagues, of course, you're, you're thinking in a science way, but it's really the heart that is driving you to take action. How does it feel for you and your colleagues from CCNY and the Hack Spaces to be doing something that is so urgently needed? We're getting lots and lots of thank you selfies that make it pretty obvious they very much appreciate what's going on. Um, but you know, they're really the people in the front lines. We're just trying to do what we can to help them. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. Having to leave Brookdale, my dorm, was pretty devastating because it really was a community of other Hunter students. I met all of the friends I have now at Brookdale. Regarding just general news about coronavirus, it has been a lot mentally. I already suffer from anxiety and just the severity of the situation has been getting to me. I found out that I was in direct contact with the person that later tested for the coronavirus and she tested positive. I did not have as severe symptoms as she did. I just slept the entire time for days. I've struggled a lot mentally and emotionally being away from my family, them being in Sweden, me being here. And now that the borders are closed, it's very, it feels more definite than it did before. I recently lost my mom, so I feel like I'm still grieving and just not being able to be outside and distract myself, you know, going to school, seeing my friends, I'm going to work. That helped me. My dad, who's in the of income in the house, has not been working. My brother has been laid off. So there's also that worry about not knowing what's going to happen and having to put food on the table. As a Macaulay Honors student, I have the Wellness Center at my disposal, which provides counseling and therapy for Macaulay students who need it. That has been an incredible resource for me. I am very thankful that the school has been very flexible. The professors have reached out, making sure that we, the students, are okay. I already have a really hard time focusing uh, because I'm dyslexic. CUNY and Hunter are doing everything they can to just support all their students during this time. I know that there are so many resources now that they're making available for everyone. Every time I wake up, you know, I stretch, I meditate. Maybe I could have some makeup so I can feel more normal. Things I've been doing to cope is just trying out new recipes in the kitchen. Uh, I love to cook. I definitely recommend reaching out to your friends, giving them a phone call if you can't Zoom. Try to set a schedule on when do they watch the news so you do stay on top of things, but not overwhelm yourself because it does take a toll on your mental health. I think we really need to be present, meditate, be kind to one another, and try and stay hopeful because there are a lot of good people working on this. And we'll get through it together. As we all know, many of the steps taken to slow down the coronavirus outbreak are having significant effects on everyday life. Our own Andrew Falzone explores how CUNY is helping small businesses weather the coronavirus storm so that they're ready to return once it passes. As healthcare workers wage war on the front lines of coronavirus, an invisible war is being fought on another front. The U.S. government has approved a series of historic stimulus packages, but unlike 2008, this stimulus isn't just for Wall Street. There's a tremendous focus on Main Street. 
Stanley Clarence knows all about helping those small businesses. He's been the executive director of the Small Business Development Center at Lehman College for the past 20 years. We spoke via Zoom. I'm sure lots of uh, small business owners are, are coming to you. Um, what are they saying about uh, what they need right now? So the, so the problem right now is how do you survive? Um, and and I, the question I'm getting with some, some merchants, I'll just talk to the Merchants Association a few minutes ago, uh, that they're reluctant to take on another loan. So even though we, it's a favorable loan, the rates are great, so 1% rate on the uh, economic injury loan, and it can go out as long as 30 years. I don't, you don't necessarily want to go out that long, but you can go that long. And it's a question of trying to sustain the business for the next two or three months. Hopefully not three, but two months. Get them back on their feet. And it's basically to cover payroll. They're basically, all your working capital expenses for the next uh, two or three months that'll cover your working capital, keep you going. Part of the stimulus was aimed at keeping employees on payroll so when the economy is ready to restart, we can hit the ground running. We'll take your average payroll and give you two and a half times that average payroll uh, as part of the loan program, plus some other working capital and other things. Now, if you retain the employees or if you bring the employee back within a certain period of time, uh, that portion of the payroll loan is forgivable. Okay, so, and you don't have to make the first payment until for six months. But the main thing here and, is to bring, for you to bring the staff back and make them whole again. That's that, and then it's forgivable that portion. People are asking you, when is this going to be over? Um, what are you telling them when they ask you that? Let's hope that we can get back. But when we do get back, be prepared for a lot of business, hopefully. But if you're in a borough besides the Bronx and need a solution closer to home, you can find the Small Business Development Center in your area by visiting americassbdc.org so that when the time comes, you'll be ready to help restart the economy and open your doors. I'm Andrew Falzone for Urban U on CUNY TV. Switching gears in the middle of the semester like this uh, has been a challenge, but at the same time, a real opportunity. Many online classes are new, not only to faculty, but also to students as well. Students also need time to adjust and adapt uh, to the new learning and studying style. Some students don't have a fast internet connection at home or a decent computer. Through the different responses I have been re receiving, I learn to understand my students emotionally and also help them understand that everyone is in this together. Ironically, though, we are physically um, separated. I feel like I am more connected to them because we're spending more time discussing things that are non-academic related and we have more frequent contact. Things that before we were just too busy to talk about or we're just like checking in with each other and making sure that we're doing okay just on a, not on a professor and student level, but just on a human being level. One of the video conference app I am using for my class has a function of recording the lecture. This allows my students to catch up or review any part they didn't understand during the class and I am able to review my lecture to see if I missed any impossible contents also. I've decided to do this through Zoom. I, I'm keeping to a synchronous mode of learning. They've been deeply appreciative of that. Uh, we're able to have these conversations in real time. This could be an excellent opportunity for people uh, like our students to really connect to online learning, but also online teamwork, um, online collaboration, and all the other parts of online that are now much more normal in the business world. Things have been actually quite smooth uh, considering the whole situation. Outside of Kingsboro, I also do something called Shipped. This is a part of the drop shipping phenomenon that's been going on, but my job is a little bit different. I go out with my protective gear, of course, and I shop groceries for people who cannot leave the house. I also pick up medications and drop those off to people who cannot get out of the house as well. So that's just a little something about what I've been doing while this COVID-19 outbreak has been going on. So I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. Thank you. Since John Jay College established its prison to college pipeline in 2011, Boz Dreisinger, the program's founder, has been doing extensive work to bring awareness to mass incarceration. 
Here's a look at her latest project that she conceived with her former students and visual artist, Hank Willis Thomas. This space is a very didactic space. It's a space that is six by nine. That is the average measurement of a prison cell. On the walls of this tight space, centered in the openness of the New York City High Line, are writings, notes, poetry, art, academic papers, thoughtful words written by incarcerated people. All of this stuff was created in, in spaces like this, where people are pretty much forgotten. My name is Matthew Wilson, and I'm a curator of Writing on the Wall. The Writing on the Wall is an uh, installation that was created to bring awareness of mass incarceration and also bring awareness of the talents and academic abilities of people who are incarcerated. This is the cover of my graphic novel, Swords of Fortune. I'm a formerly incarcerated person. I did 13 and a half years. And to be able to get the word bubbles on the page, I had to actually cut them out with a um, sewing needle. The whole purpose of the writing on the wall is to be able to give a voice to the voiceless. That's the reason why I was in a public space. See, here it is, you can't avoid it. If you're on the high line, you can't avoid it. If a person reads one line, that means the person that actually had this thought was actually acknowledged. When I was 17 years old, I was arrested and ultimately convicted and sentenced to 18 years. My name is Devon Simmons. I'm one of the curators for the Writing on the Wall installation. Both Wilson and Simmons are graduates of John Jay's Prison to College Pipeline Initiative, a reentry program that provides inmates and former prisoners with higher education. Through that affiliation, they were tapped to collaborate on this project. These writings are literally from all around the world. I actually had the honor to go pick up some of them from the UK, um, South Africa as well. But there's also writing from some of the guys that, and women that I met in Jamaica. There's writings from Brazil, El Salvador, Chile. I mean, it shows the global crisis that mass incarceration is having on communities all around the world. 11 million. That's the number of people who are in prisons around the world. And though the United States only makes up 5% of the world's population, 20% of the world's incarcerated people are right here. Mass incarceration is the civil rights issue of our time. In the world, I would say that it's very much the same. Mass incarceration has been used, continues to be used as a system of oppression against the other, whatever that other might be. So uh, it could be Aboriginal people in Australia or in Canada, uh, poor people in Uganda, women in certain contexts, particularly in Southeast Asia. My name is Boz Dreisinger. I'm a professor of English at John Jay. I founded the Prison to College Pipeline program here as well. The idea of prison as a response to crime is a really a US invention. Prison privatization and supermax prisons. We built the modern prison system in the early 19th century, modeled after a lot of European ideas that were floating around at the time. And then ultimately what happened is that you had various colonial leaders coming to see that the prisons that we built, especially Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, which is now a museum. And so you saw the reproduction of these prisons down to the very architecture. Dreisinger adds that prisons don't work to reform individuals, education does. Hence her work with the Prison to College Pipeline program. What inspired the writing on the wall? So the writing on the wall started as a collaboration between me and Hank Willis Thomas, the visual artist. This is true of anyone who's taught in a prison. When you teach in prison, you're kind of awash in papers, in letters, in the written word, in a way that you're not so much in the outside world anymore because everything is digital. And so I would come back from Australia and I taught an autobiography writing workshop, for instance, and I had all these papers. I didn't want to throw them away. They're valuable. They're kind of, you know, scraps of human lives. This is a piece called Resiliency by Roland Davis. Am I someone who looks at life for what it is? Someone who can accept the hard facts of reality and still move forward? These are people who are inside, who are locked up. This is our, is our responsibility as a community to find out the reasons why our people are actually being warehoused in spaces like this. 
Yes, I'm all that and more because I am the embodiment of resiliency. I'm someone who knows the struggle, that, that struggle brings growth. I am someone who understands that growth brings knowledge. The writing on the wall was set to be on display in various cities in the US and abroad, but with the coronavirus pandemic underway, it's been postponed until the fall. Here's one we were able to film before the stay at home order. So it's sometimes hard to see past all the marketing noise around GMOs, right? To get to the actual science behind it. And that science may just be the key to feeding the world in the 21st century. Professor Eleanor Wurzel of Lehman College and the CUNY Graduate Center here is at the forefront of what's called synthetic biology. There are only a few ways genes can change. One is evolution. Somewhat faster is selective breeding. Say, a farmer cross-pollinating to bigger tomatoes so that the offspring has a greater chance of being big too. And of course, recently, genetically modifying organisms directly, GMOs, has opened up the potential for making changes more rapidly than ever. When nature, and, and I should say breeding, is based on natural evolution, natural evolution is very, very slow. So whereas nature might take 350,000 years to create an enzyme that performs a certain task, we can do this in the laboratory in 18 months. What Professor Wurzel is talking about is an emerging field called synthetic biology. I met with Professor Wurzel at her laboratory at Lehman College, and she explained that synthetic biology takes the concept of GMOs to a whole new level, a level we're going to need to keep up with demand. As we look forward to a growing population where it is estimated in the year 2050 there will be 10 billion people, we have much bigger problems. We have to feed the world. And the current methods that are based on simple breeding can keep pace with our needs. To put that population growth in perspective, it took us almost all of human history, about 300,000 years, for us to reach a population of two and a half billion people. That was in 1950. And then, in just another 100 years, we're projected to quadruple that. Seven and a half billion in a century. And the scientific community is focused on making plants more efficient and more effective to support that population. For instance, what might synthetic biology mean for a farming region that's been hit by drought from climate change? The goal is to make a root structure that can carry water, maybe more water than the traditional root structure. It might mean taking a native gene, a gene that's already in the plant, and just retooling it to make it work better. Or it might mean taking a gene from another organism that does the same job, because after all, our, our DNA is not so different, let's say, from DNA in a mouse. There, there are a lot of similarities. And there may be just the right DNA that's there. We just have to fix it a little bit, and now it works in the plant. Whereas GMOs typically just insert one gene change, synthetic biology aims to test several gene combinations to find just the right result. And that's what sets it apart, taking more of an engineering approach to iterate on designs. To date, a lot of these kinds of innovations are still in their infancy, but some applications are already out there. Take vitamin A deficiency, affecting over 250 million children around the world. In many parts of the world, sources of vitamin A, like beta carotene in carrots, are hard to come by, as the population relies on staples like rice instead. As such, scientists like Wurzel were able to engineer a new type of rice, which produces beta carotene. Vitamin A deficiency causes children to become blind. They die from childhood diseases such as measles. Completely unavoidable if they would just get healthier food. Golden rice has one gene from daffodil, it has a gene from bacteria. But the gene contains the information for making an enzyme necessary for making beta carotene. So the instructions are not so important. It's the product that's important. Indeed, that's all genes are, instructions to tell the plants what to do. The food itself is just as real, no matter what instructions it has. That being said, of course, there's still a lot of distrust out there when it comes to GMOs. And that's something that Wurzel hopes synthetic biologists can better engage with the public on in the future to avoid misinformation. Because feeding the world is going to take all of us. Students need to be trained to address problems that society has identified problems or industry has identified problems 
And now scientists are going into the lab and coming up with the solutions. And at the same time, I would say that society needs to be fully engaged in implementing the solution. If they don't feel they're part of the process, then they will be very suspect of something like GMO. And hopefully that won't happen in the future. From the biology labs at Lehman College, improving new technologies today so we have enough food for tomorrow. I'm Ari Goldberg for Urban U. That is our show for this month. Be safe hanging, everyone, huh? And don't forget to follow us on social media and check out our webpage, tv.cuny.edu. We'll see you next time. Bye. The census is a count of everyone in the United States, no matter your immigration status. The census count is how our communities get billions of dollars for programs that we all rely on. Who here has filled out a census before? You in the back. Starting March 12th, you'll be able to do this online or even over the phone. Now let's go through some of the questions. This looks easy. So the census asks, how many people live in your home? Do you rent or own? Everyone's name, how you're related, age, ethnicity, and home phone number. So me and my wife, we have two kids. I'm 40. You get the idea. Your information is completely confidential. By law, it cannot be shared with anyone. The census only comes once every 10 years, and 2020 is our chance to get it right. 